William Tyndale was that English scholar who was the leading light in the Protestant Reformation, and is best known for being a translator of the Bible. However, Tyndale himself, like so many during the Tudor period and during the 16th century, met a bloody end in front of a huge crowd. So join us today as we look at the horrific execution of William Tyndale, and to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. William Tyndale was born in around 1494 in a village in Gloucestershire. His family went by the name Hitchens also, and William would use this name sporadically throughout his life. His family were also related to the Tyndales of Northamptonshire, Norfolk and Essex, who were rather wealthy and prosperous landowners, wool merchants and administrators. He was educated first at a grammar school near to Stroud, and it was during his time at university in which he began to study theology. Tyndale started a Bachelor of Arts degree at Magdalen Hall at Oxford University in 1506, and in the same year he became a subdeacon. He then became a Master of Arts in 1515, and was deemed to be a virtuous man who led a clean and unblemished life. Being a Master of Arts, he was allowed to study theology, and he complained that the course did not study scripture. Tyndale wrote that they have ordained that no man shall look on scripture. He was extremely talented with languages, becoming fluent in many, and between 1517 and 1521, he also attended the University of Cambridge. Tyndale also became a chaplain to the home of Sir John Walsh, and a tutor to his children, and his opinions began to shock local churchmen, to the point where he was summoned before a local chancellor to discuss his beliefs. He was most probably suspected of heresy, and it's considered that Tyndale proclaimed, I defy the Pope and all of his laws, and if God spares my life, ere many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plough to know more of scripture than thou dost. So with this he was criticising the restricted access to scripture and the Bible that the people of England had at the time. It's clear that from early on, he thought about bringing the word of the Bible to the people of England. Tyndale then moved to London in 1523, and wanted permission to translate the Bible into English. This was incredibly dangerous, as since 1408, to translate anything from the Bible into English was classed as a capital offence, in which one could lose their life for. He met with Cuthbert Tunstall, the Bishop of London, who refused to support Tyndale's work, but did allow him to escape prosecution after outlining his intentions. Following this meeting, William realised how for a man who wanted to translate the New Testament, England would not be the home for the man who wanted to do this. He then left for Germany in April 1524, and it is considered that he even travelled to Wittenberg, the place in which Martin Luther began the Reformation, when he nailed his criticisms of the Catholic Church to the church door. William Tyndale could not understand why the Bible and Scripture was in a language that people could not understand. He wrote, all the prophets wrote in the mother tongue, and thou could never understand it. They will say it cannot be translated into our tongue, they are false liars. At this time in Germany, he began to work on translating the New Testament, completing it in 1525, and editions of Tyndale's New Testament were printed in Germany and also in Belgium. In October of the following year, Bishop of London Tunstall condemned the translation in England, warning booksellers to burn any copies that they had found. Tyndale arranged for these translated Bibles to be smuggled back into England, and he declared that he hoped everyone would become more knowledgeable in scripture and become as knowledgeable as a priest. Sometimes these Bibles were even hidden in bales of straw. The majority in England could not read or write, but those that could would read from the English Bible aloud to their friends and families at secret meetings. What they learned is that the Catholic priests had taught them things that weren't inside the Bible. Over the next few years, around 18,000 copies of Tyndale's New Testament were printed and smuggled into England. John Fox wrote how the Bishop of London arranged with an English merchant to buy every copy of Tyndale's translation and gather them together. They then burned 6,000 copies of his new edition on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral, and in England, Henry VIII's advisers began to target Tyndale's friends as heretics, executing them in horrific fashion. Tyndale went further, publishing in 1528 The Obedience of a Christian Man, and in this he advocated the king, 
of a country as the head of the country's church, more so than the Pope. It's believed that this book hugely influenced Henry VIII when he declared the act of supremacy, with the famous king becoming the supreme head of the Church of England. Henry was impressed with this book, and it's considered that Tyndale wrote this book to build an alliance with Henry VIII in their fight against the Pope. William Tyndale realised, however, that he could probably never return to England. He was engaged in a fierce literary battle at the time with Thomas More, who acted as Henry's Lord Chancellor and also pursued heretics. He criticised Tyndale, and people who supported his ideas were burned in front of huge crowds, and many more were arrested and interrogated. In England, to be associated with Tyndale was very dangerous, and he settled in Antwerp in Belgium. Tyndale then began work on a translation of the Old Testament, being helped by John Frith and Miles Coverdale, and he was later joined by John Rogers. They worked hard on the translations, and continued to export Tyndale's Bibles back to England, and Thomas More even stated that anyone who read and distributed these writings were to suffer a painful death. In 1530, Henry VIII went further, giving an order that all English Bibles were to be destroyed, and people caught distributing Tyndale's Bibles were to be burned at the stake. This order to destroy the Bibles was successful, and only two copies of Tyndale's Bible have ever survived. Tyndale did also write about the planned annulment of Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, but he did oppose this. This may have angered Henry VIII further, and turned him against Tyndale. In 1531, he was visited by a friend of Thomas Cromwell, who invited him to return to England, but Tyndale refused, fearing arrest if he returned. He was now in conflict with the king, and this would not have ended well. Thomas More even sent one of his close friends to arrange the arrest of Tyndale, but this ended in failure. The next person to try and arrest him was Henry Phillips. He had previously gambled all of his inheritance away, and fled abroad. He offered his services to capture Tyndale, and after befriending him, led him into a trap. Tyndale had settled in the household of Thomas Points, and on the 21st of May 1535, Tyndale was betrayed. He was taken to Pierre du Fief, who raided Points' home, and confiscated all of Tyndale's property, including his works, papers and books. His work on the Old Testament was kept by John Rogers, and following this, Tyndale was taken to Vilvorde Castle, outside of Brussels. Tyndale was thrown into a foul-smelling and damp dungeon inside the castle, and was given very little respite and company, with the moat licking the walls of his dungeon, making his cell rather damp. In this solitary existence in the dark, Tyndale waited for the end, and he was held here for 16 months. His arrest of Pierre du Fief had gained a reputation for hunting down heretics, and was motivated by the fact he was given part of the confiscated property of his captives. Tyndale, who had a great reputation across Europe, was tried by 17 commissioners, and his trial was led by three chief accusers. At the head of this was the most notorious heretic hunter in Europe, Jacobus Latimus. Tyndale at his trial even conducted his own defence, however this was to little avail. William Tyndale was found guilty of heresy, but he was not to be burned alive. As he was a distinguished scholar, he was to be strangled first, and then after death his body burned. On the 6th of October 1536, he was taken out of Vilvorde Castle, and led towards the southern gate of the town. The sun had barely risen, when he arrived at a clearing where a crowd had gathered. The crowd that day were there to witness the execution of a man deemed to be one of the greatest heretics across Europe. A circle of stakes enclosed the place of execution, and in the centre was a large pillar of wood in the form of a stake. A strong chain hung from the top, which was threaded through a hole in the upright post. The attorney and the doctors arrived to the execution, and Tyndale was brought to the post in his place of execution. He was asked to recant, but he refused. His eyes were fixed on the people, and the execution was prepared. William Tyndale was tied to the post, and the noose was placed around his neck. He was then forcibly choked to death, in front of a huge crowd, struggling and spluttering in panic. His last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. It took a moment for Tyndale to die, as the air was choked out from him, and following this, 
His body was burned in front of the public, as was customary for heretics, to prevent any relics being collected. Within the next three years, William Tyndale's legacy as a talented scholar, religious reformer and translator was shown in its full light in England. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell were key members of Henry VIII's court, and they wanted the Bible to be available in English, despite Tyndale's brutal execution. The edition they promoted had the name of Miles Coverdale on the cover, but it was mostly Tyndale's work. Cranmer approved this version, and then presented it to Henry VIII, in the hope that it would secure royal authority. Henry agreed to this, and every parish in England had to purchase a copy of the Bible and display it. This secured Tyndale's legacy in history, and shows us that although he met a brutal and bloody end in Europe, his ideas and works, eventually in England, were accepted and promoted.